Welcome to the Endless Knot podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Today we're going to be talking about another video. This time we're going to be talking about Paddle Your Own Canoe, which was another one of the ones in the Ways of Knowing series. Yeah, so this is one of the early ones that we put out again, and another one that had a sort of long history to it before I turned it into a video. It had its genesis in teaching, right? That's right. It started off when I was teaching a course, first year introductory course, that focused on narrative. There weren't a lot of parameters for the course other than it just talked about narrative. Right. And so one of the things that I decided to do with that course was you know, have kind of thematic units of different right. types of narrative, narrative on, on different sort of grouped around different themes. And one of the themes was travel narrative. Right. And as I was putting that together and, you know, assembling all these travel narratives from different periods and, mm -hmm. you know, to show how they change from, different genres, from and... different genres and different, different periods. One of the things that I noticed was that there was an interesting connection between the sort of, well, travel technology, particularly sailing technology, mm -hmm. and the sort of metaphorical idea behind, or the, the way that the, the travel was used as a metaphor. Right. In the narratives that you were looking in at. In those narratives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I kind of held on to this idea for a while, and I, I sort of wrote it up initially as a, a blog uh, Back in the old, your old blog. My old blog. And I've sort of come back to it and revised it a number of times. It started off as sort of three, three parts post. And then I kind of revised it into one longer post. Mm -hmm. And it sort of kept getting revised over the years until I started working on the videos. Right. And so it was one of the first ideas that I wanted to, to turn into a video. Yeah, I think it may have been one of the very first scripts. That and the detective story were, were the your two. first scripts and that you worked on for quite a long time while we were yeah. still trying to figure out what you what these videos were going to look like literally what they were yeah. going to look like how we were going to do that there was a very long learning period where we figured out software yeah. and technical yeah. aspects and didn't understand any of that and while we were working on all of that those were the two videos you were really focused on is my memory of it yeah i was a yeah. bit hazy now but it worked really well because i was playing around with the this idea of the um concept map and because of the right. travel idea it it sort of visually, translated visually yeah. into a map so nicely so yeah and it is one, I still think, one of the prettiest ones because that background, obviously we're going to play the audio now so you'll hear it, but of course you can't see it. If you want to look at it, you have to go to the YouTube channel. And I've got to say the background, that map that you used as a background and the way you laid everything out so that the, the connections go from place to place on the map and actually travel around geographic locations, not ones that are you're speaking about exactly. No. But still, the take a journey through as if you were tracing a trip on a, a sea voyage, it's still one of my favorite in terms of what it looks like. It just yeah. works so mm -hmm. well. All right, so without further ado, why don't we play the video soundtrack to Paddle Your Own Canoe? And Mark and I are going to listen to it, refresh our memory about what exactly we said in it, and sip on our dark and stormy cocktails, which is what we're drinking today. Dark and Stormy, if you don't know it, is normally ginger beer and rum, and it seemed appropriate for a nautical-themed video. So enjoy, and we'll be back after the video soundtrack to talk about some of the stuff that is brought up and other thoughts we've had since we made the video and other connected ideas. Cheers. Cheers. When you hear the term metaphor, you may think of high school English classes and the many literary terms you had to memorize. But metaphor, the implied comparison of one thing with another, is a fundamental way of thinking about the world. We often make sense of the world around us by using metaphor. This is something we begin in infancy. When a baby spends hours putting a block in a box, taking it out, and repeating these actions endlessly, she is constructing a mental schema of inside and outside of a container, a schema we later apply to the world around us. When we say we are in trouble, we are conceiving of trouble as a container. This is a metaphor, a way of understanding some new, more complicated thing by comparing it to something we already know. Large-scale cultural metaphors, such as the journey of life, affect and are affected by our whole world view. Over time, the use of this metaphor in the Western world has changed, mirroring our changing cultural attitudes to our place in the world. 
What I want to explore in this video is the intriguing parallel between the literature of travel and exploration and the worldviews it reflects, and the development of sailing technology in Europe. Because the narrative metaphor of travel and exploration reflects cultural change from the ancient world to the modern, it often describes man's relation to the world in which he lives. And I'm afraid that for most of the authors I'll be speaking about it really is man's relation to his world, so that's the language I'll use here. This narrative is symbolic of man's place in the universe, and the use of this narrative metaphor changes over time to reflect different beliefs about man's place in the world, as well as practical changes in the way we move through that world. In the Odyssey, one of the oldest recorded travel narratives in western literature, we see human beings at the mercy of the elements and the gods. Odysseus and his crew are constantly driven about against their will by the elements. This reflects a common idea in Greek mythology that humans are at the mercy of capricious gods, which in turn reflects the usual Greek view of humanity's place in the universe. And crucially, this is entirely consistent with ancient sailing technology because the ancients had square sails. Now the important thing about ships with square sails is that they are not very manoeuvrable. Essentially you go in the direction that the wind blows you. If the wind is blowing the wrong way you're out of luck, and you have to wait for a favourable wind. Sure you have oars so that you can row, but that won't take you very fast or very far. If a storm blows up you use the oars to row quickly to shore if you can, and this in fact happens at one point in the Odyssey. Thus in ancient Greece sailors were at the mercy of the wind, and so we see a sense of helplessness in the Odyssey. This connection between worldview and narrative of travel stands out when we look at what later writers did with the Homeric story of Odysseus. The same story has three different meanings for Homer, Dante, and Tennyson. Homer's Odysseus is simply at the mercy of the gods. While he does take some interest in the things he sees along the way, his journey is not a product of his own will. In fact, he's very unhappy about it. His journey and his life are both determined by the fates and the prophecies about what will happen to him. In the Greek mythological world man can't control his own fate. In the medieval text The Divine Comedy, in contrast, the great Italian poet Dante places Ulysses in hell, being punished for his arrogant exploration of the world beyond the boundaries of Greece. For Dante, Ulysses' journey was an act of will. Dante hadn't actually read Homer himself. From Dante's Christian viewpoint, willfulness was sinfulness because man shouldn't try to control his own fate, as that was up to God. And finally, for the 19th century English poet Tennyson, in his poem Ulysses, the hero's journey is also an act of will, but it is more positive. Tennyson exalts his purposefulness and striving. In the poet's view, man should try to control his own fate. Thus for Homer, sailing out into the ocean is an action already subject to the capriciousness of the gods, for Dante sailing out into the ocean is bad and Ulysses is placed in hell for it, but for Tennyson it is good and he is lionized for it. Backtracking to the Middle Ages for a moment, there was relatively little advance in sailing technology from the ancient world, so we can see a similar metaphor used to describe the journey of life. However, the characterization is different in the Christian worldview. For instance, in the Old English elegy The Seafarer, harsh exile is pictured in terms of a lonely journey in a boat, and the moral and religious implication of this exile slash pilgrimage is that the Christian soul's ultimate destination is back to God. God is the only goal to steer towards. Similarly, in the later Middle Ages, in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the Man of Law tells the story of Custance, who is set adrift at sea by her antagonists to get rid of her. She puts her faith in God, in him tristi and in his moradir, that is to me sail and ache mystere. God is her sail and her rudder, her means of propulsion and steering. Again, this is a metaphor of the relationship between the Christian soul and God, and therefore of man's place in the world. Though as in the ancient world man does not control his fate, it is not a capricious God to whom he is subject, but one who is the best steersman because he alone can actually guide the ship correctly. In a parallel but slightly different culture of the time, the Vikings, known as great sailors in the earlier part of the Middle Ages, who really only had the square sail, cheated a bit by lowering one end of the sail to allow for greater maneuverability. But for the most part they made do with very simple means and no sophisticated navigational equipment. They were often blown off course, and as described in the Vinland sagas, it was often due to accident that they made discoveries such as Greenland and Vinland, in other words North America. Interestingly, there's quite a mix of chance, fate, luck, both good and bad, pagan and Christian worldview in the Vinland sagas. Things started to change in sailing technology in the late Middle Ages or early Renaissance when the triangular lateen sail began to be used in Europe. Triangular sail works like a wing, high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other, and it allows a ship to sail almost directly into a headwind. By tacking in a zigzag pattern, ships can go in any direction and are no longer at the mercy of the wind, as long as there is at least some wind. Ships also started using sternpost rudders rather than steering with an oar hanging off the right side, starboard, literally the steering side, as opposed to the left side, called port, which was the side toward the dock, also known as larboard or loading side. The stern mounted rudder made it possible to steer larger ships, and larger ships could carry more provisions, including most importantly fresh water. 
These combine with the old square sail to take efficient advantage of favourable winds, as well as improvements to navigational technology allowed for real exploration to begin at the end of the Middle Ages and throughout the Renaissance, kicking off the European Age of Discovery. These advances are reflected in the imaginative literature of the period. This is the age of humanism when the cultural focus shifted from the purely religious to the world of man. People began to define their place in the world in terms other than solely spiritual ones. The 18th century, for instance, is full of travel literature, like Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver goes out into the world ostensibly to discover things about other people and places, but in fact reveals to the reader much about his own country in the process. Mankind now defines itself through its exploration of the outside world, and especially through its ability to direct its own course in the world, though shipwreck is still a danger. This is a radical shift from the medieval seagoing metaphor as demonstrated most clearly in Chaucer's Custance, who is really only defined by her relationship to God and is completely unable to control her own journey. The humanist shift in cultural focus goes hand in hand with the seagoing technological shift. With the 19th century we enter the modern era, in which the biggest technological advance in seafaring was the steam engine. Suddenly ships were no longer dependent on wind at all. Even if there wasn't any wind a steamship could still go. The technological progression of the square sail to the triangular sail is completed with the advent of the steam engine. This is dramatically demonstrated in Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days, in which just such an incident happens. When the winds die down the steam engines are fired up, and at one point Phileas Fogg nearly burns up the ship itself in an attempt to win his race against time. This is the ultimate expression of man's desire to control his own fate. Fogg overcomes all obstacles thrown in his way in order to win the bet, and that includes the obstacles of the natural world and the elements. This reflects the Victorian elevation of man's ability to control his world. In this worldview, man has a special place in the world, he is at its pinnacle. He even seeks mastery over nature, nature is now something to be tamed or controlled. And it is in the late 19th century that science is really beginning to challenge religion with the realization that the geological age of the earth is vastly longer than the Bible accounts for, and Darwin's evolutionary theory challenging the biblical creation story. Victorian man did not adapt to his surroundings, he adapted the surroundings to suit himself, and this is subtly commented upon in Verne's novel with the description of the British Empire which sought to impose its customs and organization, often unsuccessfully, upon the world. Furthermore, there is a shift from the age of exploration to the age of tourism. The world has been largely explored by Europeans, and Fogg is really more of a tourist than an explorer. Because the world is now a much smaller place, man's stature seems the larger. Instead of defining himself in relation to the world, man redefines the world in his own image. At the dawn of the 20th century, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness stands out as the most striking example of the travel and exploration metaphor. Now instead of a journey outwards, it is a journey inwards. Instead of defining his place in the world, man is defining himself. Man's relationship to the world becomes his relationship with his own inner psyche. Since sailing technology is no longer a limiting factor, the metaphor takes a new direction. Man's attempt to control nature and the world around him becomes his attempt to control human nature and the world within him. But this sense of control is an illusion since he has no real self-control. Now, well into the 21st century, we continue to grapple with abstract concepts using concrete metaphors. But yet again the metaphor is in the process of being redefined for a new era which is notably self-referential and solipsistic. The story I've just summarized follows the transformation of the travel metaphor as enacted in the literature and lives of mostly men only through the European world and only into the 20th century. I'd love to find examples of this connection in women's lives in other cultures, how is life like a canoe trip, or from more recent times. Do we now write stories in which life is like a transatlantic flight, or an actual flight into space? Let me know what you think in the comments or tweet me at, at alliterative. And so I leave you with this little bit of obscure though apropos verse. Leave to heaven in humble trust all you will to do, but if succeed you must, paddle your own canoe. So at the end there we posed a question, you posed a question about other versions of this narrative because as you said you, this came out of a class, right? right? So you were doing a certain range of literature and you wondered about other stuff and maybe we can come back to that but I think it's worth asking again anyone who's listening to this podcast we still are interested in knowing that right we still want to have suggestions about other right other instances of this kind of narrative especially from the non-canonical or the more recent yeah I mean, and I mean that's the thing since I was teaching an English class I focused very much on English literature. Yeah. And so it is mostly canonical, fairly central kind of stuff. Central kind of stuff. Of dead white men. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
and I only just took it into the 20th century. Heart um, of Darkness, yeah. With Heart of Darkness. And I do have, a, you know, some things to say about more recent, not so much in, in the, just in the literature, um, but in terms of, you know, TV and film as well. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of other areas that we can go with this. Yeah. Someone in the comments mentions a uh, Persian story. Yeah, The Conference of the Birds. Right. So that's an interesting thing. We haven't really followed that up, but it'd be in, I'm sure there are stories in other cultures, not just in the Western tradition. But before we talk about that more, because I do, I want to talk about some other things too. The one point we didn't really make before the video was about metaphor. I mean, you mentioned that it was a metaphor, but the video starts off and in many ways, this is your video about metaphor, metaphor right? Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about metaphor? Yeah. One of the things I wish I'd, I'd done and, you know, it's an early video, so I hadn't kind of settled into, you know, the pattern yet, but to start off talking about the word metaphor yeah, itself, the etymology, the which etymology. Is your, your thing. I mean, and it comes from Greek, you know, literally it means, you know, meta across and the four part means to, to carry, mm -hmm. basically. So to carry across. So it's the idea of carrying your meaning or your, you know, the, the important idea from one domain into another. So it's actually itself a metaphor for travel. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. To, to, or transport, in yeah, a sense. Well, it's a Transporting a good. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this, this leads me to, you know, what the cognitive scientists now do with this concept right. of metaphor. It's more than just a, you know, as I kind of said in the video, it's more than just a, uh, an ornament, a literary mm -hmm. ornament. Um, it seems to be pretty fundamental to the way we think. Right. And, you know, in particular, the big names here are uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who wrote mm -hmm. a really influential book in the, I think the early 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, called Metaphors We Live By. Right. And uh, it is this idea of, you know, what's sometimes referred to as conceptual metaphor. It's like, it's that idea that I use in, you know, that example that I use in the video of a baby kind of figuring right. out the world. Right? right. And so the idea is you, you use something that you already know. To... Or that you can access in a very concrete way. Yeah. You can touch, you can feel, yeah. you can see, you can... Something that's... Something more abstract. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, it's transferring information from one domain, right. physical relationships, for mm -hmm. instance, mm -hmm. to another domain. And the, the, the trajectory there is always from something more concrete to something less concrete. Right. Now, you know, your starting point can be as you further, get more sophisticated, as you, get more sophisticated you can use, yeah. you can use, you may start with something that's already not, it's already particularly something concrete, not yeah. particularly concrete, but it's always in that direction. And so it's a great way of kind of repurposing knowledge you already have to deal with new knowledge. Right. When you've got new input. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a remarkably efficient system that we've, you know, kind of evolved to, mm. to use. Uh, mm. And it certainly has, you know, done human beings well over the years. Mm-hmm. Who is it? I'm thinking of which science fiction thing am I thinking about who doesn't understand metaphors? Oh, I know. Thrilling Adventure Hour. There's our requisite <laughs> shout out to another podcast. Oh, podcast. Um, in Thrilling Adventure Hour, uh, which is a podcast, old time radio in the style of new time broadcast podcasting. If you don't know it, go check it out. They've stopped making new episodes now, but it's really fun. And it's sort of a spoof of old time radio shows. But one of them in Sparks, Nevada, Marshall on Mars, his Martian companion, Crouch oh. the Tracker, doesn't understand metaphor. It's one of his things. It's sort of a play on the Tonto character in uh, The Lone the Ranger. Lone Ranger. Right. And because he's a native, he's a Martian native, Martian native um, right. and they kind of spoof that. But one of his things is he doesn't understand metaphor. He takes everything literally, literally okay. which is a little, obviously it's playing off the Spock character a bit too. That, yeah, right. Because Spock's a bit like that. But Spock is sophisticated enough to, he may not use metaphors himself much, but he understands them as a, he can make the logical, whereas Crouch, the tracker, really cannot understand them even when they're explained. And so that they play on that through the entirety of the series about yeah. how he takes yeah. every single, I do not see the chicken that you are speaking of crossing the road. Or, you know, so he doesn't understand jokes either, but, but he can't handle metaphor. Right. So it just made me think of, well, of that, that. That made me think, of course, the other really significant sci-fi example of metaphor is star trek the next generation darmok um, at tanagra <laughs> yeah the, so uh, uh, an With alien species that 
communicates exclusively through metaphor. metaphor. Though the, they're, the fun thing, they call it metaphor in that. I think they talk about it as metaphor. To me, it's literary illusion. Yeah. It's not quite metaphor, actually. And I think I got that wrong. Is it didn't? It's Star Market. Uh, no. Uh, I, didn't get, I didn't get the words right. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm sure all of our Trekkie friends will know what I'm talking about. Or we can just use the internet. Well, then, use the internet. You find that. But yeah, I remember thinking about that when it's... The show is really interesting from a linguistic point of view. But on the other hand, it's, of course, ridiculous. But I remember thinking that really what it is, is it's intertextuality and elusiveness, not actually metaphor. Because it's referring to a story that is a fully developed story. Uh, but you, uh, it was Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. Oh, okay. Specifically. Yeah. So w check that episode out if you don't know it. But it is, it's pretty famous as a an attempt to do popular linguistics, really. <laughs> in sci-fi, right? The episode specifically is called Darmok. It's the uh, it, uh, next of course. second episode of The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, season five, episode two. Go I'll on. put it in the show we'll notes. Put, put it in the show notes. So <laughs> you can presumably find it on Netflix or whatever. Or probably YouTube, but I'm sure we wouldn't point anyone to any kind of copyright infringing YouTube. That would be very wrong. Anyway, okay, so that's metaphor. And the development, I mean, the point of the video is the development and the parallels between development of metaphor and the development of cultural not individual cognition, really, so much as cultural cognition, if that's a thing. Probably isn't. But it the like way it should, be a thing. it should be a thing. If it's not a thing, somebody get on that. But it, it, and the idea that, that a culture as a whole uses metaphors to construct, to construct or reflect their relationship with the world. Well, and uh, it, you know, that is uh, an idea that's, you know, fundamental to... Uh, all the stuff about conceptual metaphor is mm -hmm. it, it is very much culturally rooted yeah. as language is. Mm -hmm. So the sorts of metaphors that are used in one culture are in not one language be the are same. not necessarily going to yeah. be exactly the same. There are certain patterns, like certain things you expect will happen frequently, mm -hmm. certain mappings. But the details from... of them, like, I mean, the one you have often developed is the metaphors for, for time. That's yes. something that's a particular interest to you, right? And spatial metaphors mapped onto time it's a general pattern. It's a general pattern. But which way the spatial movement is, is mapped onto which kind of time is not absolutely universal. Changes yeah. can change depending on the context, on the cultural context. Yeah, that's right. Whether you see the future as ahead of you or behind you or whether or whether it's sort of left to right or right to left or, or linear or cyclical down, or linear or cyclical there there are a number of different ways of mapping the physical world onto the domain of time. Mm -hmm. But that mapping of concrete physical orientation onto the abstract of time is, is very common. Maybe if not universal, at least yeah. very common. Yeah. So I had some thoughts. You asked me to think about this video. Let me share some things because this came out of your teaching. And right now I'm teaching an epic class. Right. And I've been thinking about the movement from the Odyssey to the Aeneid specifically. Okay. So I'm teaching Roman epic right now. So you talked about the Odyssey, and then you talked about the development of the, the idea of Odysseus and his journeys through later reception. This came up in class, and I don't know if other people find this, but I find that there's a lot of stuff I don't know until I say it in class. <laughs> like, quite genuinely, like, I'll plan a lecture that involves four words in point form on a lecture, four things I want to talk about. And fairly frequently, I don't realize something until I've said it. <laughs> That's... <laughs> That's how teaching works for me anyway. It's actually how a lot of my life works. I don't know a lot of things until I say it. It's probably why I talk so much. <laughs> but one of the things I hadn't thought specifically about until I talked about it in class last week, I think, in the Aeneid, which is Virgil writing the Iliad and the Odyssey together and doing better. One-upping Homer by putting right. the Iliad and Odyssey into one poem and making it even better. He therefore has Aeneas in many ways follow the journey of Odysseus. So the first part of the Aeneid is Aeneas leaving Troy and heading to Italy. Right. In that journey from Troy to Italy, which has the stop in Carthage with Dido and all of that famous stuff, he actually, especially in book three, goes and sees a bunch of same places that Odysseus saw. Like okay. he literally, he picks up 
a guy who was abandoned on the Cyclops Island oh, in the okay. rush to go away, for instance, and they rescue a Greek who says, I was abandoned in the cave when they were going and don't go near Polyphemus. And they see him from a distance and they are warned. So they avoid Scylla and Charybdis. And it's very carefully modeled on, he doesn't do the same things that Odysseus does, but he sees many of the same journeys. So it's fanfic. Oh, it is. Oh, yes. The Aeneid is absolutely fanfic. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, all of Roman literature is fanfic for Greek, in particular Homer. I mean, Ovid writes the Heroides, right? Which right. is all the great yes. yeah, Roman, yeah. Uh, all the great Greek myth hero heroines, letters from them. It's totally fanfic. So anyway, yes, that that's definitely true. But also in that journey, it made me think about that and Apollonius of Rhodes, who writes an Argonautica in the Hellenistic period, so about 100, yeah. 200 years before Virgil, Apollonius writes an epic about Jason and the Argonauts, right? But he's writing, again, long after Homer. But he's writing a story before Homer. So the Jason and the Argonaut story in myth happens before the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay. But of course, he's writing it long after the Iliad and the Odyssey and in the pattern of the right. Iliad and the Odyssey. So he too, it's a voyage, just like the Odysseus. They have a fairly straightforward journey to Colchis to find the fleet, Golden Fleece, but on the way home, they get blown off course and they end up in all sorts of weird places. So there's this sort of same like the Odyssey being blown all over the place and not knowing where they are. But one of the ma major differences between the Odyssey and the later works mm. is that in the Odyssey, Odysseus goes off the map. He literally goes off the map. What right. you're talking about, he's blown off course. He can't control where he's going. But not only that, he doesn't know where he's going, because in that world, in the Bronze Age world, and then in the archaic world in which Homer, you know, written down or whatever, but that the Odyssey was created, they knew a certain amount of the Mediterranean, but they didn't really have maps, physical, literal maps. They had a certain amount of seafaring knowledge. Certainly the Greeks had traveled as far as the Black Sea a little bit. They had traveled through the parts of the Mediterranean, but they hadn't gone out into the Atlantic. They didn't know the whole Mediterranean. So when Odysseus heads out into the seas, the Sirens and Scylla and Charybdis and Circe and Calypso and the ends, it really is off the map. It's in the unknown world. Right. But for Apollonius of Rhodes in the Hellenistic era, the entire Mediterranean is mapped. The entire Black Sea is mapped. You know, they, there are people literally writing coordinates down. They've worked out a mapping system. They're starting to draw maps. They know that whole world. So when Apollonius writes the, his epic, Jason is exploring the unknown. But all the way, Apollonius is like, and this is this place with these people in it. And it was named after this. And it became this. And it's for his audience. It's filled with references to places they know. It's full of scholarly details about the geography of the place. Right. Because while to Jason it's an unknown world in theory, to Apollonius and his audience, it's a completely well-mapped world. Mm -hmm. And then for Virgil, it's even more so. I mean, the scholarship just continues to happen. And now the Roman world, it's all, it's mare nostrum, right? right. That's yeah. the Roman world word for the Mediterranean is our sea. It's not just known, it is owned. In the Augustan period, the entire Mediterranean with only a very small few exceptions, is Roman. Right. They've also been out through the Black Sea, and they've also been out through the uh, Pillars, Pillars of, of Hercules. Hercules. They've been through the Pillars of Hercules. They've been out to the Atlantic. So now Aeneas is, again, conceptually off course, and yet he knows everything about it. He keeps getting warnings from people and telling him where to go and everything. So to get back to the metaphor idea, yeah. no longer is it a story of exploring the unknown where the metaphor is sort of to the underworld and the magical, semi-human, semi-mythical semi-psychological, I know that's an anachronistic word, but I mean, in a way, you can read Odysseus's journey as a psychological, you, you yeah. can read all these monsters that he meets, all of these things, you can use it as a metaphor for that. But that's not for Aeneas, that doesn't make any sense. This is the world that is going to be the Roman world, and, and, and there's a very strong temporal vision where Aeneas doesn't know this world yet and has only prophecies. But Virgil and his audience know that this whole world is destined to become Roman. And it's, there's this strong teleological fate about right. what's going to happen. And so now it's not in any way a metaphor for explore. It's not exploration. And so even though Aeneas is still very much at the mercy of the gods. So getting back to what you were talking about. Because yeah. he is. He's blown off course multiple times. He's shipwrecked. Things happen. And of course, the whole Aeneid is about him having to follow the fates. The gods tell him what to do and he has to just do it whether he will or not. And he doesn't want to most of the time, but he has to do it anyway. So in that way, it's the same as the Odyssey. But 
the travel itself no longer has that feeling of total helplessness because now it's different because you're just traveling around the places we already know about. He may not be in control of which place he ends up, but they're all part of the world he knows. Right. They're not exploration now. They're not pushed off the edge of the world. You can see that very clearly in the fact that all of those places that in the Odyssey are, you know, the Scylla and Charybdis or Calypso or the Cyclops Island that are all just these unknown, bizarre places that are not located in any real space. They aren't given any geographical location. In the Aeneid, and in Argonautica too, uh, before that, they're very concretely located. Polyphemus is off the shore of Sicily, and Scylla and Charybdis is the is the strait between Sicily and Italy, and like they they have been pinned down. Scholars have decided where the places in the Odyssey are. They've pinned them on the map, and now when Aeneas visits them, he's not off in fantasy world. He's exactly where we all know. We all, as Romans and and everyone ever since, has known exactly where they are. So there's this very different conception of the world, and it doesn't take away from the larger idea of at the mercy of the gods but i think it's a it's very interesting to see how there's a real movement that comes out of a cultural shift which is the larger understanding of the geography of the world and then the larger imperial nature of the hellenistic period the post-classical period and then the helen and then the augustan and, and roman empire period anyway that just came up i didn't go into quite so much detail in class about it right but there's a really big shift and i think that that is interesting to trace connected to what you were talking about it's interesting when dante gets a hold of this story he also is having i mean the, the sort of larger part of it is he, he's also having the virgil character yes. lead the dante character to not somewhere that is unknown in the larger sense but somewhere that is unknown to mortal humans right right you have to be dead to go where <laughs> he goes in a strange twist of etymology he has virgil as his Cicerone, Cicerone, his Cicero. Because, you know, that's the word for guide right. in Italian. Oh, okay. And it comes from Cicero. I don't know if that's the word he uses in it in Dante because I don't know medieval Italian. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it would be, it's just funny, that, that classical origin. And so, you know, he leads him not only through the underworld, but out in, to the other side where the island of Purgatory is literally on the, the Antipodes, on the exact opposite side of the world from Jerusalem. Right. And that island is, according to Dante, what Odysseus caught sight of when he went out on his second journey or whatever. Oh, the the, the later one where he has to go back to the where sea. Where he has to go back. In, so in he the post-Odysseus uh, story. Yeah. yeah. And so he... Post-Odyssey, he, sorry. And, and so he goes, he goes sailing again. He sails, apparently, all the way around the world, mm. catches sight of the island of Purgatory, and then is instantly sunk because... He's this not allowed, was, to, get not allowed to get there. He's not allowed to get there. He's sinful. Yeah. Right. Um, but of course, Dante himself is able to to get there, uh, led by Virgil. Virgil all the way through the underworld, and he gets mm -hmm. to the island of Purgatory. And Dante, I mean, the world has not been completely explored in Dante's time by any means, and he doesn't know, for instance, about the actual Antipodes or anything no. like that. But it is a much bigger world for yes. Dante. Yeah. The world is much more well-known, and it is a much bigger world. He may not know the whole globe, but he certainly knows a lot more than the Romans did about Italy and Dante's time. Still doesn't know the whole world, yeah. but he knows a lot more. A lot and more again, there's yeah. a lot more precision about uh, navigation and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So the idea that he would now pinpoint those places. I think that's what I'm thinking of, is that movement from they're just beyond our ken right. to... They're fantasy places, but they have a physical location. We think we want to pin them down or this idea that you mm -hmm. can pin mm -hmm. them down as to a place. And I think that reflects a tiny precursor of that Victorian idea yeah. of being able to control places because you knew where they were. Yeah. That knowledge is in some portion a control, an understanding yeah. Yeah. of the world. And while the classical world doesn't have that completely, they have more mm -hmm. of it. And maybe in a little bit, you can even see it in Virgil compared to Homer. The Aeneid is so teleological. It is so about the goal, which is the ultimate destiny of Rome and the ultimate role of Rome in taking over the whole world. So while there's fate, it's not capricious fate. It's fate with a very direct purpose. Right. Right. It's not just the gods are toying with us like in Homer. There, it's who knows what the god's purpose is. You never know. They're just mad at you for some reason, or something happens, or Odysseus. Odysseus never really knows that Poseidon is mad at him. He just gets tossed around because of yes. Aeneas knows exactly what the fate is, and there is a very direct purpose. 
So the difference there is it's still he's at the mercy of the gods, but there is a grander plan. Mm -hmm. And that's moving a little more towards mm -hmm. the, the Christian conception of God. You may not know what God wants well, from you, but you but can trust that there yeah. is a plan. Yeah. Yeah. And really, in, a, in many ways, that is true of the mm -hmm. Aeneid too. The later idea that Virgil is a pre-Christian Christ Christian, which Dante, of course, is using, is sure. ridiculous, of course. But in a sense, some of that stuff about the sort of larger destiny of, of the gods does find its expression in Augustan literature yeah. before ever coming into Christian literature, that there is a grander plan. And since you brought it back around to the Victorians, of course, it's important to mention that, mm -hmm. that um, you know, when Tennyson is, is writing, he is writing in the Victorian period. Yes, yeah. Well, so, that's what I was thinking um, of, yeah. You know, that, that, that does make sense of the fact that he treats the story the way that he does. Mm -hmm. It is this idea of the Victorian control of mm -hmm. our, you know, for, I mean, this is the time Ex when the M British Empire, they do think of the world as basically theirs. Mm -hmm. I mean a very large part of the wor world was theirs at, at that At least point. in some form, mm -hmm. in some form of theirs. Yeah, much in the way the Romans considered the Mediterranean our sea, yeah. the Victorians are now considering it our globe. Yeah. I mean, you get that iconography even yeah. of the Britain on the globe. Yeah. This is our world. Yeah, and so their conception of Odysseus as, or of the idea of exploration is not the idea of exploration just into the unknown, it's the idea of taking over going out and fixing it on a map and then once you fix it on a map you own it <laughs> which to be fair is a tiny bit in the odyssey because at one point anyway odysseus it was the age of colonization when that poem was being created the island right next to the cyclops island when he lands there he says it's an amazingly fertile island you know if only somebody were here and plowing it and establishing a colony it would be a really good fertile place to have a colony so you see that colonial right. imagination at right. play, even in the Odyssey. It's to a much smaller degree, of course. But there is that idea. That is the period when the Greeks were going out and colonizing around the Mediterranean. Sure. But sending up colonies in the Greek world was a different thing than sending up colonies in the Victorian world. Yeah. <laughs> so some other things that I wanted to bring up. One of the things, if you do watch the video, there's a visual that I use, and I don't really engage with it directly, but it was, it mirrors very nicely what I was, you know, the particular metaphor that I was playing with there is the series of paintings by an artist named Thomas Cole called The Voyage of Life. Right, right. So we'll put a link up to it's, that yeah. particular set of paintings and you can have a look at them, but it, it does indeed visually represent this idea of life as a journey. Life in terms of stages of life, right? Stages Childhood, of life. youth. Yeah. Yeah. adulthood and old age and there is a definite sort of christian religious mm -hmm. aspect to it so um it, it's interesting to have a, a look at that and the other i mean i mentioned you know being influenced by lakoff and johnson and this book metaphors we live by interestingly there was a, an earlier book by ernst Curtius, uh european literature of the latin middle ages which talks a bit about fundamental cultural metaphors okay and in, in some ways i mean it, it's looking at, at the sort of larger scale rather than the sort of personal metaphors that, that you use to just navigate your conceptual daily life, metaphors yeah. mm -hmm. it's looking at well what sort of large-scale cultural metaphors sort of ideology in a way yeah. ideological metaphors and so in a sense this idea of the journey motif and its mm -hmm. relation to uh, the humans human beings conception of their place in the world right in relationship um, with god in, with god kind of fits into in, into that sort of way of looking right. at, at things too yeah. So that was another kind of influence. Um, influence on this. And I'm going to say it because we have to mention it every single episode. Yes. The other one, of course, is... James Burke. We just rewatched the James Burke Connections episode, right? Yeah, like episode just a few... two, Death in the Morning, in yeah. which he... Talks uh, about the development of sailing technology. Yeah, so how they go from the square sail to the, the triangular latin mm -hmm. sail, and then the stern post rudder, and this allows them to And he talks about explore. it in terms of how it changes their cultural ability to do things. But he, he doesn't, of course, tie it to the metaphor no. in the same way no. you do. But it is... It was a very clear influence on yeah. your conceptualization of that technological change. Yeah, that was, and and see, that's why it it occurred to me because mm -hmm. I had sort of known that you from know, Burke, yeah. from Burke, and I knew that very well, and so I had that kind of in the back of my mind when I was looking at the the literary mm -hmm. use of this metaphor. And that's why you, you know, noticed I thought, that oh, pattern. Oh, you know, there's yeah. this pattern. Yeah. 
Now, earlier on, you brought up this idea of the spatiotemporal metaphor, mm -hmm. how, you know, mapping time onto space and mm -hmm. so forth. And it, it sort of makes me think of the, this kind of larger question of how we see spatial metaphors worked out in kind of literary or other other ways. I mean, oh, one yeah. of the things that, you know, with the uh, with the spatiotemporal metaphors, it's been pointed out that uh, cultures that read left to right tend to conceive of time left to right yeah. Yeah. or the other way around if you read uh, if you if you have a language that reads right to left the script that reads right to left and it's and i think it's not just necessarily the script but also the way that the book is put together yes. right? are you turning the page yeah i just mean not language it's not a, the, no, yeah, yeah. not the, language the, the but writing, writing system, system. Mm -hmm. yeah and that that kind of made me think and i you know i think others may have pointed this out before as well the way that visually how you see journeys depicted in television and uh film mm -hmm. right do you have journeys Our left to right or right to left yeah. I, i'm sort of kind of going anecdotally i haven't you know gone and sort of you haven't done the research i haven't yet. actually <laughs> counted them up but you very often see for instance in star trek mm -hmm. journeys out going for exploration or whatever right words going right words mm -hmm. whereas journeys home when they return back to earth mm. it's it's the other way around right, right i don't know if this is consistent all the way through and how how well, that features in other sci-fi right. but probably not entirely consistent probably but not. it may well be yeah. be something to yeah yeah so but i'd love to hear about other examples of this if anyone knows any mm -hmm. Or if anyone's done any work on that kind of depictions of, of, yeah. of physical depictions of, of travel. Because I would imagine, you know, in, in sort of historical, more historical terms, I mean, the, the kind of uh, ec journey of exploration is westward. Well, it depends. It obviously depends where you're starting from. Depends, depends where you're starting from. You but are in Western where, literature. In Western literature. Well, after Greece. Yes. So journeys of exploration from Greece go eastward. Eastward, right. Right? But... It's true that once you move into the Roman world, the Roman world goes east to some degree, but then they go west. They The, the things they have never heard of before, the true exploration really is westward. Right. right? Britain is Britain. westward. Yeah. Now, though, you only think of that as left and right because of the way that the, the maps map are now... Yeah. Classical maps and medieval maps did not necessarily have, didn't north have north as the up no. and, and, and all those things. So, yeah. but, so yes, I mean, in my mind, too, I think of left and right. Yeah. You know, that you go to the North America, you're going mm -hmm. left. That's very much constructed by map perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's an interesting point. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about how a writing system can influence our use of the metaphor. Yeah. To what extent, then, is our map orientation mm -hmm. Relevant. Oh, absolutely. No, and, and I mean, people have talked lots about how the way maps are depicted, of course, changes our entire conception of the world. Yeah. The Mercator projection and its ridiculously distorted uh, conceptions of what parts of the world are bigger and smaller that yeah. completely confuses our con concept of how big Africa is, for instance, <laughs> things like that. So, yeah, but I'm sure that that affects our metaphors, too. Yeah. So getting back to the question you posed at the end of the video. Yeah. One thing, and for all I know, you're preparing to talk about exactly the same thing because we've just been watching the same stuff together, but you want metaphors based in the 20th century and about space. How about Doctor Who? Because we just watched, for another project that is unconnected to this, The Horns of the Naimon, right. which has the metaphor of, and I know if you're an old Doctor Who fan, you know that you don't like The Horns of the Naimon, but we like The Horns of the Naimon, ridiculous yeah, as the show is. It's a particular, it's a uh, fourth Doctor episode of Doctor Who. And in it, it very specifically has the journey of life. Right. Right? The Naiman are on the journey, journey of, of life. life. Yeah. And one of the, there's a couple of things I want to say about that. One is that one of the plot points hinges on the fact that the people on the planet that are being exploited by the Naiman think they're being metaphorical. They think the journey of life is a symbolic, because the Naiman keep talking about, we must progress on the journey of life. Yeah. And the guy who sort of is the so high Dee priest comes role. comes out and he says, you know, the, the Naiman speaks of the great journey of life. And he and, thinks it's metaphorical well, and symbolic. Yeah, he specifically asked, what does that mean, the great journey of life? And he specifically says, it's a metaphor. Yeah, there you go. Whereas it turns out, it's very literal. The Naiman are traveling yeah. from one planet to another planet having used up all the life on one planet and moving to the next planet so that they can continue, continue living. Life, yeah. So it's not a metaphor at all. It's actually strictly literal. That's one of the confusions. They use that sort of metaphorical interpretation to, to bamboozle the people that they're taking advantage of. 
But also, the other thing that's neat about that is that, of course, that whole story is itself based on Greek myth. Right. Right? So it's the Theseus story. So the Naimon are minotaurs. They're bullheaded people in a labyrinth. And the doctor is helping a guy who is taking on the Theseus role. There's these sacrifices being sent. And so it's it's a, a complete and very explicit. He, in fact, the doctor even talks about it at one point and explains it. It's an explicit takeoff of the Theseus story. So here we have that classical reference, right. but a metaphor of the journey of life. And it's a journey of life that has changed its metaphorical meaning because of technological change. Yeah. Right? Because the Naimon are moving planet to planets because they've now got this bizarre whatever. They use a black hole to provide energy to make a transport corridor. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It's Doctor Who. It doesn't matter. But it's obviously a technological change. It's a bit of an advance on a steamship. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. (laughs) And so the metaphor has changed or non-metaphor because it's literal. But still, the idea of the journey of life has changed because now it's a a different technology. So there you go. Yeah. And while I'm on Doctor Who... The other one that we watched, which was the Jason and the Argonaut themed fourth Doctor episode, also apparently not a favorite with the fans, but a favorite of mine because, again, of the Jason and the Argonauts one. Yeah, the Underworld. The Underworld, right. I couldn't remember the title. The metaphor is the quest, right? The, the ship. Quest is the quest. The quest is, is the there. quest, say yeah. the people on the ship who've been traveling for thousands and thousands of years and regenerating and continuing their quest. So there again, there's a very strong metaphorical and symbolic meaning to this quest. And then it finally ends and they find what they, but then, you know, what they thought they were looking for is not what they find. And what they find is not what they thought they were looking for. It's all very, it's a bit heavy handedly symbolic, in fact, (laughs) it's really intentionally explicitly so. But again, it's technology that drives the change in how that metaphor works, because they've got this spaceship and they've got this regenerative technology and all the rest of it so the way they think of how the metaphor of travel or how travel maps onto life yeah to the journey of life metaphor and there they very very much it starts off when the tortoise sort of encounter first encounters that ship mm-hmm. on the quest is they talk about being just like on the very edge of space if yes you can they are kind of they are at, of off the thing. edge of so they are map, off the map there the map, yeah 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 and and that's part of their problem is they can't track things anymore and they're always following the tracks yeah so i just thought that that was there you have I mean, Of course, science fiction is always about travel, but the point is not just are there stories about people traveling with different technologies. The point is stories where the travel is used as a metaphor to map onto Onto, life, right? onto how how life, and both of those specifically, because the Jason and the Argonauts one, it's all about finding the um, race bank, right? With the genetic information to continue life again. That's the whole, that's what their quest is for. And they're going to refound their civilization somewhere else with the the race bank. And also, though it's not actually made really clear in that story, those people on the ship who have been regenerating and regenerating and regenerating and are so tired of it that they keep trying to postpone their regeneration and not regenerate and die mm-hmm. because they are so tired of being on this quest for literally thousands, thousands of years. Of years yeah. It is not made clear, but presumably when they finally are able to refound their civilization, they're going to be allowed to die. To die. Yeah. So their life journey has been arrested yeah. by their long actual their journey. Long quest. Yeah. So there's a there is a tie there between the the journey, you know, they have not been able to complete their journey of life because their quest has not been completed. Yeah. So the completion of the quest actually and it's it's a kids show so they don't they make don't this clear. That, yeah. But it and I think there is a, a definite sense that with the completion of their quest they're also going to be able to complete their lives. Yeah. So there is a, I think a metaphorical link end made to there. both the physical journey and end to the metaphorical journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was what I was thinking about in terms of the question you asked. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> the, the, those weren't the particular examples that I was thinking of. So, but We've been thinking about Doctor Who and its references to classical myth and history, just for the record. That's why we've been re-watching some old episodes that are particularly tied to that. But right. that's why we happen right. to have seen those, and they were in my mind. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what were you going to think about? Well, I was still thinking in, in the kind of Star Trek. Yeah, well, um, I mean, Star Trek is a, is a fertile ground for yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that's often pointed out is, you know, in the original series, they really were explorers, right? They're yeah. going off the map. Mm-hmm. 
whereas in uh, next gen, they the next mostly gen, aren't. They aren't. No, they're only not uh, very occasionally, enemies. like when uh, Q pushes them yeah. off. The, but 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 their their mission is almost always like diplomatic or yeah. rescuing people or sometimes they're mapping stellar phenomena mm-hmm. and things. But you don't get the idea that they're out of known space. No. They're just or they're maybe you know right on the edge with uh, you know having um, encountered another encountered another species mm-hmm. on the species on the edge of their mm-hmm. territories or whatever but then they don't get to go and explore there because they're not allowed to go in there yeah that's true so it's changed it's from explorers to like you're ta- talking about how around the world in 80 days is the movement from oh and you know what actually that reminds me that that's one of the things too that does happen in the classical world too mm-hmm. explorer to tourist because we yes. actually have right. literature like pausanias being the most famous where people start going on journeys in the Hellenistic world and in the Roman period just to see things. Sure. So we have yeah. handbooks. Pausanias lists, he's like, when you're in Athens, here's the shrine you have to see. And mm-hmm. here's the other, and this were, this is a particularly famous place. And when you go to Ephesus, these are the things you have to see. And I was told about this, and this is the best thing to look at. And here's where, he doesn't actually give ratings for hotels or anything, but it's very much a tourist guide. And that is a real transformation, obviously, from the time of either exploration and colonization or conquest. It's neither of those things anymore. Now it's just tourism. You actually travel for pleasure and as a sort of intellectual exercise to see the world and Mm -hmm. learn about Mm -hmm. things. And that's what you have in Next Generation, really. The exploration is the exploration of the meeting of cultures. Yes. And the idea that you're learning new ways of being human by interacting with other with species yeah. and seeing how other or other yeah. humans or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that shift, you know, from the original series to the next generation mm-hmm. is kind of like the shift from, you know, the Homeric or the Greek mm-hmm. uh, and the, the later Roman. Uh, yeah, takes I think on that's this. true. I think that makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, returning to one last point about metaphor. There's a recent project that has uh, oh, mapping metaphor. Mapping metaphor. Yes. And I haven't had a chance to really fully play with it yet, but it is now freely available to anyone Mm -hmm. online. So we'll put a link to this and you can start playing around with it. But basically what they did is they mined the information from the historical thesaurus of English, which basically organizes all of the synonyms for any particular concept together. And so they use this as as a way of teasing out, you know, how metaphors have worked over over time, Mm -hmm. how, how Mm -hmm. how the mappings from one domain to another uh, how shifted, that's changed, changed changed over the years, right? Because right. it isn't it isn't consistent over mm-hmm. time, right? These these kinds of metaphors change culturally, mm-hmm. right? Not, all, not with technology, but uh, for other reasons, for as various well. cultural yeah. reasons. Yeah. 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 So you can kind of play around with, uh, you know, you can explore that and see well how have the metaphors for you know the journey of life or any other kind of concept, uh, concept how mm-hmm. that has changed over time, right? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I mean, it's a we're hardly the first to say, obviously, it's a hugely rich general field, the field of metaphor. Yeah. And even the sub idea of just the journey, the travel metaphors is a huge, rich area. But I, what I like about what you did with the canoe, it's the links between different realms, much like a metaphor is a changing of one domain to another domain. Being able to say like literature doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is, it has, it relates to other literature and it relates to culture, but it's affected by things like cultural changes and it's affected by changes in the way that we conceive of religious relationships. Yeah. But religious relationships are also affected by technolo- technology and are also affected by literature. These are interconnected ideas and that you can gain new insight into any one of those fields by thinking about the other fields. Sure. And I mean, that's the basic premise behind the kinds of investigations you like doing. But I I think that this is a particularly clearly rich topic and a rich area for mining that kind of interconnection. You can see them. You can kind of pinpoint them because the technology does change quite slowly, but drastically when it changes, you can kind of pinpoint the moments when things change in a way that it's harder for some kinds of of other ideas. So I think our drinks are done and I'm out of topics of what we needed to talk about. So I think we're done for the day. Indeed. For more information, check out the website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. 
You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can, and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.